Friend, just describe uh, what's the message you're hoping to send to the governor as this is likely to eventually make it to his desk? Well, I think New Hampshire can live without the death penalty. And what we heard today was really powerful testimony from family members of murder victims who explain why the death penalty doesn't work for them, why it doesn't work for law enforcement, why it's a bad public policy, and why it should be repealed. And I would hope that the governor would take the time to kind of sit and listen to and talk with family members of murder victims who oppose the death penalty to perhaps evolve his position on the death penalty. All right. Great job. Anything else you'd like to add? New Hampshire can live without the death penalty. All right. Great job. You want Can you hear me? We can hear you. The sound system is not on. Oh, all right. And I, uh, over over the period of time, <clears throat> considering the death penalty and having interviewed three individuals who were on death row. One was on death row for 17 years, and he was on death row wrongfully. <clears throat> And I communicated with him uh, on my TV show. You're very welcome to go to my TV show and look at it. But uh, he was framed. And he was on death row for 17 years. It cost the taxpayers of that state $17 million to process this individual who was wrongfully accused. Another individual that was on death row was for 11 years that I interviewed. Eventually he was exonerated because the exculpatory evidence that was brought forward uh, after 11 years helped him to be released. The prosecuting attorney refused to allow the exculpatory evidence to be brought forward. Recently, we've heard of cases located in Massachusetts where 4,000 DNA samples have been uh, tampered with. That's 4,000 which calls into question, could, could that ever happen in New Hampshire? Could a prosecuting attorney withhold exculpatory evidence? Could confessions uh, be made uh, wrongfully because of the fear of, of the death penalty? There are a whole host of, of, of things that have gone through my mind over the years. I believe biblically I, I believe the Bible. I believe it is the Word of God, the inerrant Word of God. And I believe when we consider the first capital crime, if you will, was Cain. Cain killed his brother Abel, according to the Bible. Hear me out. And one of the things I was taught as a child, well, you see in the scriptures where God says... Man's blood shall be required if another man kills another man. His blood shall be required. If you look at the passage, if you look at the scriptures, you'll see God did not kill Cain, nor did anyone else. As a matter of fact, there was a mark put on Cain so that no man would kill Cain. So where is the death penalty there? Then, one of Cain's grandchildren uh, killed somebody, and he was not put to death. We see that the death penalty was brought forward later on under the law of Moses. And under the law of Moses, if you were a homosexual, if you were caught in adultery, if you committed murder, if you did not obey the Sabbath, there were... There was the death penalty. And so a lot of evangelicals, a lot of people that I grew up with taught that this is sanctioning of the death penalty because it is justice. Is anybody going to get put to death for committing adultery these days? Homosexuality? How about not keeping the Sabbath? Do those not apply anymore? What's changed? A lot of things have changed. And what I discovered also is in that in the law of Moses, nobody can keep the law of Moses. Everybody 
fails at one point or another. Starting with the first commandment that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might. And then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And now I'm, I'm asking for your indulgence because this is from my background. There's some of you that don't believe the Bible, don't believe in, in God, period. And I, I totally respect that. But I want you to know why I came to this conclusion. Under the law of Moses, if a woman or a man were caught in adultery, they were to be put to death. And there was an occasion where this happened, and this person, was a woman, was brought before the Lord Jesus. And they said, Master, Rabbi, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. And the law of Moses says, we need to put this person to death. What sayest thou? And he said, you that are without sin, cast the first stone. Nobody cast the first stone. Why? Because nobody was without sin. So we go into the church age, and we see, we see all kinds of misinterpretations of the scriptures as far as I'm concerned. We see witch burnings. We see the Inquisition. We see all kinds of, of, of interpretations of how this death penalty was carried out. I struggled within my heart because I believed the Bible. But I also believe that our justice system has to be in such a way that it is able to carry out justice without putting somebody to death wrongfully. If you believe the Bible, you also believe the whole scriptures. And like in Proverbs, these six things doth the Lord hate. And one of those is hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs chapter 6. Can anyone guarantee that we can 100% of the time always put somebody to death justly without any mistakes knowing there's been 160 plus exonerees in our country knowing uh, that there is a potential for DNA to be tampered with knowing human nature as it is starting from Cain all the way till now, that corruption can creep in. Corruption can happen. And so can plain old just mistakes, unintentional problems, and therefore execute somebody wrongfully. From those of you who are offended by a biblical perspective, then look at it from a practical perspective perspective of if, if you would consider that to be acceptable. If we put somebody in prison for the rest of their life, the potential of uh, one particular case that's here in New Hampshire, uh, I believe would be the Addison, it would cost the taxpayers $1.3 million to keep that person in jail. <clears throat> to process this person with all the appeals is about five to ten million dollars of the taxpayer money. That's one case. The first case that I talked about was 17 million. One person, whereas that person could be put in a cell for 23 hours in the day and just let out for an hour for committing heinous crimes. There is something to be said about the system which punishes the taxpayers on top of the actual crime. Is it just for all of us to pay for somebody to have a lunch for the rest of their lives who did a heinous crime, put in prison, cost us $1.3 million? Or should, is it just that it costs us 5 to $10 million? For that one person, 
We're punishing the taxpayers. So I brought forward this legislation to change. Because <clears throat> there is an element of doubt that we can get it right 100% of the time. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions, if there are any. If you have a vicious dog and you let it go. Is this a trick question? It's not a trick question. <laughs> I'm being funny. Obviously, it's your, it's your fault. I would believe it's the systems for letting this person have the ability to do so. But imagine the, uh, the uh, um, who's in charge of prisons. Uh, no, I would believe it would be the uh, uh, warden. I believe life starts at conception. Uh, do we have a place to put people to death in the state of New Hampshire? Thank you, Representative. I do not believe we do, so we would probably have to build another, on top of the fact of the legal procedures, that we would also have to build a facility or house a facility. I, I don't believe we have a facility for, specifically for that. <coughs> that is a deep question, and I know some were conflicted. Uh, one, one of the... Uh, one senator in particular came to me and he was conflicted. He said, why, why did you vote this way? I know you were on the other side. And I, I gave him basically the same reasoning. Um, and he was very conflicted. And the reason he, he made a commitment that he would support <coughs> it regardless. And, and I would never encourage somebody to go against their word. So I, he will remain conflicted. The others, uh, they gave testimony. And it, it's very difficult to, to read what's in somebody's heart. Uh, <coughs> so I know people are very conflicted about it. This, did, this didn't just happen overnight with me, by the way. I, I, I've been probably the most proponent of this in my lifetime, from, from, a, uh, from, my, from my youth up. But we have to have a just system to carry out just laws. And our system, can anybody say that it's 100% accurate all the time? And I had to self-reflect, and I think that's where some of the senators are having a difficult time. I know one of the senators said to me, well, I like the Old Testament version better than the New Testament. And I, I'm thinking, well, okay. I would rather, you know, uh, I'd rather be 100% sure. And I don't think anybody can guarantee that all the time. I, I don't know if that answers your question properly. Appreciate the effort. Yeah, uh, there was an effort. So the, the, if I understand, the, the, it, will it cost the same? Um, the, I have seen no evidence that it would cost the same for somebody who's, on, who's in for, without, uh, life without parole. The only difference or the main difference is, is if we actually put that person to death and we find out later that there was exculpatory evidence, you can't go back and fix it. And there's no evidence that we haven't put somebody to death wrongfully. I've heard testimony where one out of 10 individuals on death row, one out of 10 uh, are innocent, wrongfully accused. There's actually a TV show dedicated to that now. I've interviewed three of them. One was an African-American woman. Another was a, one guy in a bar at the wrong place at the wrong time. Another one was as a result of corruption. And if it wasn't for the Hail Mary that somebody believed in these people, someone believed in these people and went and did their homework and did the research. Somebody did their homework and discovered, oh my God, what's going on here? But if we execute somebody wrongfully, is that acceptable? I would, in my humble opinion, it is not. I wasn't there, but I believe, I believe uh, his conviction. If it, <clears throat> I believe our court system de declared such, yes. I, I, that's a very broad question. Um, can people be rehabilitated? I, I think to a, a degree, does it, does it exonerate them from their actions? No. I do not have the facts on that. I do not know. 
Thank you, committee. I appreciate the question. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. I'm the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire. And I speak as a Christian, as we just heard, uh, following the Senator's testimony. Um, I'll, be, I'll be brief. The legislators and the Governor of New Hampshire now have before them in Senate Bill 593 an opportunity to counteract the wave of violence and cruelty that has been surging with greater force in our nation over the past years. I urge its passage and for the governor to reconsider seriously the moral rationale for maintaining the death penalty in the laws of the Granite State, which I believe to our shame is the only state in New England where it remains. As a follower of Jesus here on Easter week and a bishop, I vehemently object to the practice of state-sponsored killing of anyone, regardless of the heinousness of the crime of the condemned. I believe the resurrection of Jesus after being executed by the state and by religious authorities, um, that resurrection calls us and empowers us to break the violent cycle of vengeance and retribution that contaminates and dehumanizes our society. Taking human life in order to satisfy the demands of a victim's surviving loved ones, as understandable and as reasonable as that may be, still undermines the role of government to heal the moral injury of a capital crime. Worse, the death penalty makes us all citizens participants in moral brutality and sheds blood guilt upon us all. The death penalty is morally apparent, <coughs> ineffective as a deterrent to crime, and as we've heard, fiscally irresponsible. And I urge its repeal. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this story is eight years old now, and I've told it a number of times in these chambers, um, so many of you are familiar with it. I will continue to tell it until New Hampshire joins with the European Union and the large majority of other first world nations in abolishing the inhuman, unnecessary practice of state-sanctioned killings of fellow human beings. As a murder victim's family member, I strongly support abolition of the death penalty in New Hampshire. And I have issues with uh, people who speak in terms of, well, we have to take the murder victim's family members into account because I'm one of them. I know a number of others who would like to be taken into account in being heard saying, no, thank you. We don't think this is helpful. In April of 2010, my daughter Molly McDougall, then 31, was shot to death in Henniker, New Hampshire, by a young man who took a fancy to her the moment he laid eyes on her. When she declined his advances, he made a lethal response just four days later. <coughs> Molly was happily married. She was living with her husband in, in a house on the family farm. They were all, all the adults were off working to try to save the family farm. Um, she was two weeks, except she was home. She was two weeks from graduating from New Hampshire, uh, tech, the Technological Institute, in a nursing program. She hoped to become an operating room nurse. New Hampshire lost a good and responsible citizen that day, and our family lost a precious light in our lives. Now, from childhood, I had opposed the death penalty even as I grew up in a family where at least one parent strongly supported it. It just came from within me. I found it terrifying and repugnant. But nonetheless, I had sometimes thought, well, that's easy for me to espouse this when I haven't been put directly to the test. The question, what if it were your loved one, hung in the air, and now it was my loved one, 
and I felt even more strongly uh, just a sense of relief that, that although Molly's was a capital murder, um, it didn't fit the, quali- the parameters of a, death pe- of a um, capital case at the time. A couple of years later, uh, in New Hampshire, the parameters were expanded and it would have included our family's loss. The man convicted of her murder is serving a 42 years to life sentence while the original charge was first degree murder. uh, A plea bargain got in there and it got changed, which was very hard for me. Um, But what came as a relief was that it was not ever considered a capital case. We had enough trauma in our family without the specter of a second death connected to this loss. The criminal justice system served our family to the best of its ability, but nearly eight years later, it doesn't come close to eliminating the pain over our daughter's death. I really wouldn't want to endure the prolonged ordeal of appeals, publicity, etc., only to discover for myself that an execution seldom, if ever, brings the peace of mind that family members anticipate. As another victim's family member puts it, healing is a process, not an event. Proponents of the death penalty often cite feelings of the victim's family members. As a person of faith and a murder victim's family member, I hold a a persistent belief in the possibility of redemption. The most hopeful outcome in my family's situation would be to see the man who killed my daughter make a positive contribution with the life he is now to live in prison. To see him do something constructive with that life would be to give me back a tiny piece of the goodness that lived in my daughter. Of course, there's no promise that this will happen in any individual case, but an execution would guarantee that it couldn't. I'm gonna give three points to consider when taking loved ones, uh, victims' loved ones into account. First, the death penalty is potentially divisive among victims' families, as one crime is deemed more heinous than another, or one life valued above another. Um, I think that's probably enough said. The value of life, uh, to me, one life is as valuable as another. Uh, in the state's decisions about which to ca- which cases to prosecute as capital, we don't prosecute every capital case uh, as uh, for the death penalty. So some are decided that that one's that that murder was less heinous, or well that wasn't a police officer that was just a housewife, that kind of thing. A 2012 Marquette University Law School study reported that. Victims' loved ones had improved physical and psychological health and greater satisfaction with the legal system in cases where perpetrators received life sentences rather than death sentences. And third, um, Lulu Redman, a Florida therapist who works with family members of murder victims, has said, more often than not, families of murder victims do not experience the relief they expect to feel at the execution. Taking a life doesn't fill that void, but it's generally not until after the execution that families realize this. Speaking as a person of faith, I'm convinced that state killing of a person in the name of justice is an act of ultimate faithlessness. I place my faith in a divine justice that exceeds petty human imagination. We can't begin to imagine, to guess what justice truly is. I trust the God who loves me and also loves the man who murdered my daughter to discern and carry out appropriate justice in so grave a matter as the taking of a human life. And I welcome questions. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Chuck Douglas, a lawyer here in Concord, and I appear opposed 
to the repeal of the death penalty for many reasons. In 1974, I worked over in the State House as legal counsel to the governor, and there had been constitutional problems with New Hampshire's death penalty. Uh, Warren Rudman was Attorney General, and he and I drafted what is essentially today's capital punishment statute. It's very limited. It has very specific categories of victims that are protected by it. And I'll give you one example, and that is prison guards. Um, I don't know if you've ever toured our prisons, but in Berlin and in Concord in the men's prison, uh, guards do not carry guns, batons, handcuffs, mace. They might have 50 or 60 convicted felons they have to deal with during their eight-hour shift. The reason they don't have weapons is because they could be seized, they could be jumped, uh, and they take their chances with those inmates uh, for very good reasons. And that's, I think, in part, I can't speak for all of them, but certainly in 1974, the prison guards who testified said, if they're dealing with someone who is a multiple life sentence inmate, one more life sentence is not going to make any difference. And I'll give you a good example, one right here in New Hampshire two weeks ago. Uh, this man in custody is named Michael Woodbury. He killed three people in Conway several years ago. He got three life sentences, and then he had also been transferred to Florida and he killed someone there and got another life sentence. Well, two weeks ago, he put a lock in a sock and beat an inmate to death in Florida. And he said, what do I care? I've got five life sentences. One more isn't going to make any difference. Florida, however, was not amused, and they are going to put him uh, through a capital punishment trial because there is no greater deterrent for this man than the ultimate penalty. He has not been rehabilitated. He has not apologized. He has not learned. And he shows, as the chief in Jackson, New Hampshire said in the story two weeks ago, true evil does exist in the hearts of some people. <clears throat> Now, I know Senator Avard and I are both Christians. Uh, Reverend Hirschfeld uh, spoke from a theological basis. I'm not going to do that. I don't think this is an ecclesiastical court, and it's not appropriate in my mind to debate the New, the Old Testament, etc. I would just say that I feel some people are evil, and I, I give you Exhibit A, Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler, I don't know why someone would have wanted them to do life without parole after killing six million people and causing a world war. Some people are in a category so outrageous that they deserve the ultimate penalty if due process has been followed. The New Hampshire Constitution says your life, liberty, or property cannot be taken unless due process has occurred. And life can be taken if due process has occurred. Now, the issue of Addison was raised here. Uh, I know the issue sometime is, well, how do we have 100% certainty? We have a case right now where there is 100% certainty. Absolute 100%. Concord Monitor headline, Addison's lawyer, who is there to defend him, David Rothstein, said to the jury, my client is guilty of murdering police officer Briggs. Not a lot of doubt there when your lawyer stands up and says, my guy did it. We admit it. No mistaken identity. <clears throat> No error, no DNA problem. 
no Texas jury, and very simply wanted to fight the death penalty. And that's fine, and that's what he did. He didn't prevail, but he did not challenge the fact that his client killed Officer Briggs. So when you come in and hear all these stories, this one is not one of them. And it's wrong to interfere with this process by repealing the death penalty while the Addison case is still in the court system. Uh, there are cases around the country where a prospective repeal of the death penalty <coughs> has led to the uh, commutation of death penalty sentences in those states. So you have a legal complication that I think is wrong uh, for this legislature to engage in while that matter is pending. You can't grandfather it in and say, well, we'll repeal it except for Addison. Uh, the courts aren't going to buy that. Finally, what should you do? Well, I'm here to give you an 80-yard pass. I'll tell you what I would do if I were drafting this today and not 44 years ago. I would say we need to protect another class of victims, and that's those of hate crimes. As you know, a year ago, an eight-year-old boy was hung in Claremont, biracial boy. He did not die, but the rope burns around his neck are clearly visible, and he could have died, but for circumstances that somebody changed their mind at the last minute. Hate crimes weren't really in vogue or around when Warren Rudman and I were drafting this. It wasn't something even people thought about. Uh, we didn't have hate crime statutes, but we do now. And I think you need to add to the death penalty someone who takes the life of someone because of their race, their color, their religion, that type of thing that is already in the RSAs as an enhanced punishment should be added to the capital murder statute. And I brought an amendment to that effect. I would be glad to offer. Um, obviously, someone on this committee has to do it. But I've drafted an amendment that would add to our capital punishment statute someone who took a life who was substantially motivated because of hostility towards the victim's religion, race, creed, national origin, sex, or sexual orientation, and one or more deaths result. I think that is an area that needs to be addressed. Uh, South Carolina, when Dylan Roof killed the nine folks in that famous church in Charleston, uh, Dylan Roof is a perfect candidate for the death penalty because you know what he said? He made it very clear he is not sorry for what he did. He wrote a letter and said, I have no regrets, I'd do it all over again. There are people who are so evil that they deserve the ultimate societal condemnation. And I'm not going to debate the religious aspects. I'm just going to say that if you believe some people are evil and that they should be punished as he was given the death penalty, to me that should be added to our statute. So I would leave with you copies of the amendment, Mr. Chairman. I would leave with you a more lengthy written statement by me, and I would leave with you uh, copies of the Florida article uh, and the Conway Sun article about a guy who just doesn't seem to get the fact that multiple life sentences are not a deterrent. And if you want the ultimate uh, situation of discussing <coughs> deterrence, Take a look at the Parkland shooter. What did he say 10 days ago? I'll plead guilty if it's life without parole, but I don't want the death penalty. Well, isn't that wonderful? 
isn't that nice? That he suddenly now has seen the light and says, yeah, I'll, I'll do life without parole, but you've got to take the death penalty off the table, otherwise you're going to have a trial in Florida. That's the whole point of why certain categories of people, like judges, police, prison guards, need this protection. And for you to repeal it now because of some uh, religious uh, debate, I think, is wrong. Uh, for our little society here in New Hampshire. We don't have a broad death penalty. It's a very narrow one, but it should be expanded to include de uh, hate crimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Honorable Committee. My name is uh, Richard Van Wickler, for the record. I'm the superintendent of the Cheshire County Department of Corrections, and I've been in that capacity for 25 years, and I've been in law enforcement for 30 years. Uh, in the interest of time and all the people that have to speak today, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to submit a letter I wrote to the Concord Monitor, uh, which was published. Uh, it starts out with, there is no one universal truth among all people. Um, I'm hopeful that each of you will read that op-ed. I would, however, like to recite some bullets from different people uh, in my research for this testimony today, and I knew that it would need to be brief. I'd like to start out with one by Mark Twain. He said, it's important to get the facts first and then you can distort them any way you like. And that resonated with me because as I study criminal justice, the academic and scientific facts simply do not support the death penalty. They just don't. The immoral act of state-sanctioned homicide does not align with our nation's moral character. And I say that as an Army veteran of 26 years. Sister Helen Pregian, a death penalty abolitionist, made this observation. People may deserve to die. But then she pointed out the key moral question of whether or not we deserve to kill them. The great American criminologist Marvin Wolfgang who observed an execution in Pennsylvania. He wrote, I wish only to report that death in wartime combat, as ugly as it is, has no parallel to the state's pre premeditated, highly organized, calculated death of a human being, however heinous his crimes. American collegiate authors repeatedly challenge the inherent paradox of punishing murder with a state-sanctioned version of the same crime. Having state-sanctioned homicide, the death penalty, aligns us with the moral compass of China, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and absolutely with none of our civilized Western allies. The cost of state-sanctioned homicide is at least three times the cost as life in prison without parole. State-sanctioned homicide is not a deterrent to criminal thinking, either specifically or generally. Several hundred studies have proven this. <coughs> I close with this quote from criminal justice authors, Crisberg, Marciona, and Hartney. As perspectives change and knowledge accumulates, society presumably evolves. We may one day view any form of capital punishment 
with the same revulsion we reserve for the centuries old practice of drawing and quartering in the public square. It appears that we are still a long way from a general consensus on that point. That concludes my testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'll leave this written testimony for you here. Yes, Ann Lysak. Lysak. From Portsmouth, New Hampshire. <clears throat> Good morning, committee members and chair. Thank you for this time to speak today. I'm here uh, representing my family and in support of this bill. There are many reasons to support this bill today. Some people will argue that the death penalty will bring closure or comfort to victim family members. I'm here as a victim of attempted murder and also the widow of a murder victim. And I want to make very clear today, <clears throat> if the gunman who murdered my husband had to serve the death penalty, this would bring absolutely no benefit to my family. Zero. Nothing. No benefit to my family. <clears throat> I'm also a parent, a retired teacher, a grandparent. And I ask you, what message is the death penalty sending to our next generation, to our children? We have no more right to end a life than a gunman who murders. We must build a society where killing by anyone cannot be tolerated, and that includes the government. Please vote yes on this bill, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair. My name is Ashley Barbara Keshin. And um, I'm here, I'm the chair of the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. And for those of you who don't know what the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty is, it's an organization consisting of many um, organizational members and approximately 1,600 individual members. The organizational members include social, religious, and civic organizations such as the ACLU of New Hampshire, the um, uh, uh, AFSC, American Fr uh, Friends Service Committee, the League of Women Voters, the NAACP Catholic Diocese, the Episcopal Diocese, the Council of Churches. I could go on. I think you get the idea. Um, Many of the people that you will hear from today are um, members of our organization, and they are here to tell you why they oppose the death penalty. I'm going to tell you why I do in a couple of minutes, but I want to divert just briefly to respond to one thing that um, my esteemed colleague um, Chuck Douglas talked about. And that was, he, uh, he has said many, many times, and I'm sure he said before this body, that if you uh, change the death penalty, if you remove the death penalty, then you will um, essentially take the death penalty away from Michael Addison. I don't know if any of you are concerned about that on this committee, but if you are, I'm asking you now to take your pencil, take your pen, I'm going to give you two citations to show that that is incorrect. Um, the first is RSA 21.38. It's a very simple statute. It's one sentence. I'm not going to read the sentence to you. It's a little convoluted, but it's called, uh, it's referred to as the saving clause. And generally what it says is that if there is a case that is pending before the courts, um, Actually, I don't even think Addison is still pending before the New Hampshire court. All New Hampshire appeals have been, um, have been gone through. It's, it's an established case in this court. Even if you were to repeal the law, his sentence would still stand. 
As long as the sentence was legal at the time that it was given, it cannot be changed, no matter if you take away, later take away the penalty. The simple version of this statute is that Michael Addison's death sentence will remain in effect unless the legislature specifically and affirmatively states that it intends to change his sentence to life without parole, and I don't expect that to happen. Just in case there's any doubt about what RSA .38 means, the uh, New Hampshire Supreme Court took it up a few years ago and discussed <coughs> what the consequences of this statute were. In another case that had to do with a, uh, someone who had received the sentence uh, in, a, in a case where the legislature had later repealed the law, and he came to court saying, well, that sentence should apply to me now. The, state, the case was State versus Carpentino. It's at 166 New Hampshire 9. It's a 2014 case. And the court reaffirmed that uh, unless the legislature intends to apply a law retroactively, um, it will not, the, the courts will not do that. So let's put that to bed. Um, here's my reason for coming before this court. Um, I think I have a, a, it's not a unique perspective, but it's a rare perspective on the workings of the criminal justice system. I was a member, as Mr. Barraby knows, because he sat on one of my trials, um, of the uh, criminal justice system for 30 years. About half that time I was a prosecutor and I served for many, many years in the Attorney General's office prosecuting homicides. It was my privilege to do so. I love that job. I'm wearing the necklace that was given to me as a parting gift uh, when I left there. I left the Attorney General's office, became a member of the Public Defender's office, and uh, was on there. At that time, they had a homicide unit. I was on the homicide unit. I, I stood beside about 50 people who are charged with homicide crimes. Um, my colleagues in both the Attorney General's office and the Public Defender's office are the finest attorneys in this state. They're dedicated, they're principled, they are hardworking, well-trained, well-educated, and yet they're not infallible. I was not infallible when I was in the AG's office. I worked with the best trained police officers in the state, members of the major crime unit, who had the most experience, who were the most dedicated, who worked 24 seven to help us in the AG's office solve crimes and bring people to justice. They weren't infallible. The lab technicians that I worked with were tremendous well dedicated, high, highly professional, highly trained, not infallible. And in the public defender's office, same things. People who cared and worked, to be honest, just to say it frankly, worked their butts off on behalf of their clients, day in, day out, agonized over, over uh, representing them well and zealously at trial, and yet not infallible. Mistakes were made every single day in the criminal justice system. And I want to tell you about one in particular that um, I was involved in as a public defender that could have resulted in the wrongful imposition of a death sentence. The case started on July 3rd, 1996. Um, and a little girl was murdered in her bed. Her name was Elizabeth Knapp. She lived um, with her sister. Um, it, they shared a room. Literally, Elizabeth could have reached over and touched her sister in the bed next to her. This little house, in, little apartment in Katooka. Um, uh Elizabeth's mother was named Ruth Knapp, Knapp, and she had a boyfriend named Richard Buchanan. And the family, on July 3rd, had been at a, um, a pre-July 4th barbecue where there was 
in the neighborhood where there was a lot, a lot, a lot of drinking. Uh, the next day, um, uh, Ruth Knapp went to wake up her daughter, Elizabeth, and she didn't wake up. Um, she called the police. The police came, and eventually they realized that Elizabeth had been smothered and she had been raped in her bed. The police uh, immediately came to the conclusion, which was the only rational conclusion that they could have come to, that Richard Buchanan had to be the perpetrator. And the reason that they came to that decision is that the, um, the Knapp family and Richard Buchanan lived in this little apartment building in Kentucky. Literally the whole apartment was not larger than this hearing room. Um, very small bedrooms, a small kitchen, a small living room, and the entire place, and when I tell you the entire place, I mean the entire place. I went in and I saw that, was strewn wall to wall. All, the entire floor was filled with toys and ashtrays and junk and it, the, it became apparent to the police that no one could have come into that apartment without waking up someone in the, in the household. And um, so it could not have been a stranger that raped Elizabeth. It had to be Richard because he was the only male in that house. That was, it was a rational decision for them to come to. It was an obvious decision for them to come to. Richard was at work um, when when uh, the police were interrogating Ruth Knapp. And these, again, were highly trained members of the major crime unit who had done hundreds and hundreds of homicides. Um, and they uh, spoke to Ruth Knapp and they asked Ruth, Ruth Knapp what had happened that night. And she said, you know, we all went to this party. We came home. We went to bed. Um, I don't know what happened. I didn't wake up during that night. And she said that over and over. The police couldn't believe it. They could not believe her story. And ultimately, after hours of questioning um, Ruth Knapp, they said this to her. They, and I, the reason I know this is because the interrogation is videotaped. They said to her, look, Ruth, we know that you're lying to us. We know that you know what happened to your daughter. Your daughter was raped and murdered. It had to be by either you or Richard. So if Richard Buchanan didn't do it, then you are the person that had to do this to your daughter. At that point, Ruth Knapp started to squeal. There's no other way to say it. You could, I saw it. I heard it. She's squealing. She's terrified. And she says, all right, I saw Richard go into my daughter's bedroom and rape and kill her. She said, I saw that with my eyes. Well, it turns out that that was wrong. The police were simply wrong about it. Um, it turns out that there was the person who actually raped and murdered little Elizabeth Knapp made a critical error. He did not wear a condom. And so he deposited DNA in that little girl's vagina. And there were samples taken of it. And it turned out that it was not Richard Buchanan. He was excluded. He was not the donor of that DNA. Now, I was representing Richard at the time. And um, I saw, I got the lab resort, a report, and I saw it. I looked at it. And I couldn't believe it myself. I could not believe it. It was apparent to me as his lawyer that he had to be the one to kill and rape that little girl. He had, it had to be him. And, and, um, but it turns out that he wasn't. To the, he wasn't. Ruth Knapp had lied to the police because she was afraid. There was no eyewitness to what had happened. Someone else, it turned out, the upstairs neighbor had come down into the house that night and he had raped and killed that little girl. And if, and I know um, a murder in the course of a sexual assault is a capital offense. Phil McLaughlin was the attorney general at the time 
And Phil has also testified in front of hearings like this, and he said that he would have, he was certainly being pressured to, and he would have brought capital murder charges against Richard Buchanan. And I have no doubt, as I sit here today, that Richard Buchanan would have been found guilty of this offense, and it's very likely that he would have been sentenced to death because, uh, because of the, the horrible nature of this crime. Um, and the only reason that he wasn't, is the slim of, of margin, is that the upstairs neighbor, James Dale, who actually did this, had not worn a condom. If he had worn a condom, Richard Buchanan would probably be killed today. So when people say to you that it can't happen here in New Hampshire, and believe me, I've been in front of these, of these panels now for 10 years, and I've heard people come in and say, <coughs> New Hampshire is exceptional. We have a narrow statute. We're not Texas. It can't happen here. I'm going to say one thing to you, and I'm going to be as blunt as I possibly can about it. If you, can't, if you don't believe that we are capable of making a mistake, a fatal mistake in this, in this state, then you are either hopelessly naive about the criminal justice system or you are dangerously arrogant. It's time to repeal this. RSA 2138. 21 colon 38. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is David Goldstein. I'm presently the chief of police in the city of Franklin, and I've been a police officer for 38 years. I'm here today to represent the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police in Opposition to SB 593FN. I have some prepared remarks, but I'm going to deviate a little bit as I've been listening to the um, testimony thus far. And I'm going to speak primarily in a secular level. Uh, however, my religious beliefs go back to the Old Testament. You might guess that by my last name. During my 38 years as a police officer, about 23 of those years I spent as a state trooper. And I heard Attorney Keshin talk about major crime unit. I spent about 12 years in the major crime unit, primarily doing crime scene before it was fashionable and you see television programs and all that today. During that time I investigated over 100 homicides. During that time our ban a year here in New Hampshire was 36 homicides. That year, my wife said she saw me more on television than she saw me at home. Because, as you can well imagine, state police had statewide jurisdiction to conduct those investigations. Our death penalty statute differs from all others, others in its specificity. This is further underscored by the fact that we have not used this statute since the 1930s. The philosophy underlying this death penalty, our death penalty, and its imposition is founded in the fact that it focuses on the assault of the system. I'm no better than anybody in this room as a police officer, as a man, as a citizen of the state. However, when you assault certain aspects of our community, that is an assault on the entire state. The defined groups represent our social order and our way of life, an assault on, an as on that aspect of society that protects us all. Why do people stay on death row for so long? Because we are a kind and benevolent society. Because we give every bite of the apple that we can in order to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Are we fallible? Absolutely. No question about it. And thus the reason our statute is as specific as it is. As members of law enforcement, we believe that there must be consequences for those most serious crimes that qualify under the current New Hampshire statute. We believe that this law has worked for many years in our state, and we're going to ask you to vote in expedience to legislate on SB 593. Now I'm going to share with you one case that I worked, and I believe in the history of the state it's the only one of its kind. 
I was the OIC, the officer in charge of a particular homicide that took place here in Concord in October of 1991. A gentleman, 40 year old gentleman by the name of James Colbert decided that he was going to kill his wife and his three daughters. That by definition is a domestic mass murder. We don't see a lot of those. His wife was 30 years old, his eldest daughter was two and a half, his middle daughter was one and a half, and his youngest daughter was 10 weeks old. These children were a product of that one union. So often in my profession, we hear that, oh, different children by different fathers, different mothers, what have you. These children were a product of that one union. Mr. Colbert had a problem. There was domestic violence in the household. He was getting a divorce. This was his second divorce, by the way. And he and his wife, unfortunately for both of them, decided to violate their own restraining order on this particular day. Mr. Colbert went to visit uh, his wife. She asked him to come over to watch the kids while she went shopping with her mother. That wasn't her intent. Her intent was to spend the day with her new boyfriend. When she came home, um, and he found out what the truth was, after, by the way, they had had intimate relations themselves, prior to her telling him that, he went downstairs, drank more, they'd been drinking during the day, and he made his decision and he wrote a note. And the note basically said, if I can't have them, nobody can because they will be orphans. He knew what he was going to do. He went upstairs, he strangled his wife. In a nursery, well, next to the bed, the main, in the master bedroom, was the 10-week-old in her crib. In those days, we used to put our babies on their bellies. We know better now because of SIDS research. We now put our babies on their backs. He turned his baby over, he put his hand over her nose and her mouth, and he pushed her head into the mattress until she stopped kicking, and he killed her. He then went to the nursery, which was about 10 feet away, a very short hallway, and he took the two and a half year old, turned her over, and he did the exact same thing. He put his head, or pushed her head into the mattress while he put his very large hand over her mouth and pinched her nose until she could no longer breathe. The one and a half lived a lifetime in about 10 minutes. She knew that she was going to die. She had no route of escape. She had nowhere to go. She had nothing she could do but wait to die at the hands of her father. Now I want you to think about that for a second. The terror that a one and a half year old had for that very short period of time while she looked in the eyes of her father as he killed her. And upon autopsy, we found scratches on her cheeks where she tried to remove his big uh, burly hands and could not. Now, when you go to an autopsy, by the way, I don't know if you know this, when you take an infant out of a house that's dead, they come out in a suitcase. They don't come out in a gurney, they don't come out in a body bag. Funeral directors have suitcases for these because it's so tiny. And an autopsy of a, of a 10 week old is like microsurgery, should they have been alive. Now, why do I share this story? Well, I, um, for two reasons, actually. One reason is uh, to actually support our way of view, our, our point of view statutorily. He was not charged with capital murder. He got four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole, but because the way the statute's written, it was not uh, subject to capital punishment. Secondly, this case stayed with me, as you well might imagine, for a long time, still does in fact. And I finally decided I was going to go back and interview Mr. Colbert. All his appeals had been run. He was a guest at the Gray Bar Hotel. He wasn't going anywhere. And uh, I decided to go back and interview him and ask him, why did you do what you did? And I had a series of interviews with him, and I put them on tape. And my plan is to someday, when I get a moment or two, write a book about it. But in point of fact, I, one of the pointed questions I posed to Mr. Colbert was, did the fact that you were killing your family at any time did you think about the possibility that you could go to prison or maybe even be put to death? In other words, was there, there any kind of deterrent thought in your head? Absolutely not. None. Then I asked a follow-up question. How about the people you spend your days with who've done similar things? What do they think? Well, we don't talk a lot about that. Okay, I understand that. What about what you do know about these people? Do they think about it in a deterrent uh, frame of mind? Absolutely no. So that addresses the question, I think, and gives an answer from the actor's point of view. 
that if we think that the death penalty is a, is a deterrent, it really is not. However, we do have a responsibility here, and that's a very important responsibility. And I'll just close by saying that perhaps we all wish that Solomon were here and that we could take his wisdom and apply it to this because you people have a very difficult decision to make today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. For the record, my name is Bill McGonigal. I reside in Bow, New Hampshire. Um, Mr. Chairman and esteemed members of the committee, I have appeared before the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee often in my prior role as the Assistant Commissioner for the New Hampshire Department of Corrections. I retired from that position in the fall of 2013 and am now free to express my personal points of view regarding the death penalty. My thoughts on this issue begin with a deeply held belief that putting someone to death for causing the death of another is fundamentally wrong. I do not believe that man can morally act as the final arbiter of another man's fate. It is my belief that the decision to seek the death penalty is less a matter of seeking justice than it is seeking vengeance. I seem to recall a, a church quote from when I was a young boy. I'm not terribly religious now, but the quote was, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I don't think that we have a right to do to uh, impose our earthly vengeance when it's uh, uh, a matter of the state taking a life. I've worked for over 30 years in the criminal justice system, most of that in adult corrections. I have encountered a number of individuals who have committed absolutely heinous crimes. And I believe they are due a very serious penalty for their actions. I believe that serving a life sentence without possibility of parole is just such a, uh, a penalty. And I'll veer off a touch here. The, those individuals who have committed murder that I have come in contact with, um, for a significant period of time I was the unit manager of a, of a, a housing unit of 260 some odd individuals and most of those who were convicted of murder were in that unit. Um, and the vast majority of them um, just wanted to get on with their life as they saw it in the future. Uh, they wanted to uh, have a, a life that was, um, had a pattern to it, that was, um, they could anticipate what was going on, uh, and they wanted to make sure that others uh, tried to not rock the boat. They wanted just to have uh, some peace of mind. Um, some of them, um, to answer a question about rehabilitation, some of them actually did find ways to um, live a more purposeful and, and uh, positive life while they were in prison. That shouldn't and didn't um, cause them to be released. It's, it's their life in prison for the rest of their life that is, uh, in my point of view, uh, appropriate. In my testimony, I could focus on the issues of wrongful, wrongful convictions, lack of evidence of any deterrent effect, the cost of carrying out a trial and the appeals process, and the need to create a death, penalty, death chamber, and so on. However, in this testimony, I will focus only on the issues to rela related to the actual carrying out of a death sentence. The impact uh, on those Department of Corrections employees called upon to carry out an execution, um, thankfully in other states, not yet here, um, is known to be very significant. Even when an execution goes 
as planned, those employees off, uh, often suffer significant sleep disturbance over a long period of time, frequent problems with alcohol and, or drug abuse, relational difficulties affecting their roles as spouse or parent, and frequently not able to, be, to continue in their role as a corrections professional. They have to give up their career. If these impacts sound familiar, they should. They are symptoms of post-traumatic stress. The trauma in this case is the taking of a life, period. But we know that executions often, and more frequently lately, do not go as planned. The fact that departments of corrections around the country have had to resort to unproven drug combinations to carry out their executions have led to horrific scenes of physical struggle and pain after the in, uh, introduction of the chemicals. One only need to go to YouTube and search for botched executions in the U.S. to view some of these events. They're truly excruciating to watch. Physicians, nurses, and other medical persons are not allowed to participate in execution uh, due to their oaths of ethics. Thus, the duty falls on non-medical DOC personnel to carry it out. The procedures for placing an IV in an inmate's vein uh, are not easily learned, and they require constant practice. In the correctional setting, how do we do that? Constantly practice fitting uh, an IV into someone's vein. Inmates are, inmate veins are often degraded by years of drug use. It can be very difficult to place an IV in a blood vessel. The chemicals are often de delivered into muscle tissue rather uh, than into the bloodstream, rendering the chemicals significantly degraded. If it goes into the bloodstream, it goes directly to the heart and the brain. If it goes into the muscle, it just sits there. Uh, and the sedative uh, and, uh, and paralytic effects of the chemicals uh, doesn't get the result that uh, we all hope uh, would, would, be, uh, re would have gotten uh, all, all, the, all that we would hope would have happened. The results are often extreme, extremely, extremely cruel. A corrections employee being required to administer or otherwise participate in an execution in the face of these horrific events will be sorely affected. The thought that, God forbid, the offender is subsequently found to be innocent would be, for this former correctional employee, too much to bear. SB 593 seeks to change what punishments are available uh, in circumstances of capital murder. Life without parole, uh, I believe, is suitable, moral, and effective response to such acts um, that avoids what appear to me to be obvious pitfalls. I ask you to please support passage of SB 593. <coughs> Thank you very much. My name is Jason Wells, and I am the director of the New Hampshire Council of Churches. Uh, the Council of Churches is an ecumenical Christian body uh, made up of nine denominations. Those denominations are uh, American Baptist, Episcopal, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, Society of Friends, also known as the Quakers, uh, Greek Orthodox, Presbyterian Church USA, United Church of Christ, United Methodist, and Unitarian Universalist. All of these nine denominations uh, have come to unanimous uh, agreement and recognition that the use of capital punishment is not acceptable. Uh, this is something 
that is uh, rarely found among churches, this kind of agreement. We can be a, a disagreeable group of people who split hairs over all kinds of dif- different doctrines. Uh, but when it comes to the question of the death penalty, uh, these nine churches are in agreement that the death penalty is unacceptable. Uh, I believe later on we will also be hearing from another denomination, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which is not part of the council but is also uh, in, in agreement. I know there are churches not in our membership who are part of that as well. And as others have come forward before and will in a moment, they will articulate some of that faith to you. Uh, But I do want to uh, reiterate the point that um, among these nine denominations, as well as the Roman Catholic Diocese of Manchester, um, this the council and and these other churches represent the faith and the conscience of about 500,000 Granite Staters. Uh, That's a conservative estimate, um, because I know there are, as I said, churches and denominations who are not in this council. Uh, So you could increase that number from there. These are people who live and worship, they go to Bible study and pray their rosaries uh, in the towns and districts you represent, and they go to church there. Uh, So I hope to be able to summarize the places where all of those faiths overlap. Uh, I'll do that in three bullet points. Uh, First of all, uh, all Christians affirm, particularly the statement that has been sent uh, around to you earlier, all Christians affirm that human life is sacred from its creation, that God in Genesis created human, the human race after God's own image and likeness, that that is a marking that comes and is un- indelible. It cannot be taken away from us no matter what our later actions in life are. It is for that reason that Christian denominations of all kinds, uh, and particularly around this moment, uh, can all affirm that the intentional taking of human life is always wrong. The intentional taking of a human life is always wrong. Uh, Some people like to summarize that uh, with various uh, slogans or titles or uh, uh, party labels, Uh, but it is to say that the death penalty is an intentional taking of a human life, and because of that, it is always wrong. The second point that I would make is the uh, follows from that, that because we are created by God, we are all also created as equals. Uh, This is a Christian truth, a biblical truth, but it runs beyond that of the scriptures. It is well enshrined in our Declaration of Independence uh, because we commonly recognize uh, our equality from what we are as human beings. Um, However, as others have testified before and will testify after me, Um, Our justice system sometimes does not recognize that equality, even though we have it as a high ideal. Uh, There are places where uh, we do not reflect that equality when we give in to ignorance or racism, uh, when we give in to biases, uh, 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 and we say that we affirm the equal protection under the law, but we give in to uh, things that fall short of that goal. Um, That is something that I, uh, when listening to the Senate floor debate on this bill, I heard at least once uh, somebody say, well, other states give in to racism, other states give in to bad forensic science, or other states give in to those things that render this an unequal treatment, Uh, but New Hampshire is exempt. We somehow uh, are not. Um, However, the Christian faith uh, would say that all of us, fall short of those ideals, that every person, uh, sometimes we call that uh, under various titles of our fallen human nature or original sin or any other sort of theological category, Uh, but that is to say that everyone is uh, touched by that falling short, and so we will, by our nature, apply laws unequally. It will happen. It is a guarantee. It is why we enshrine equal protection into our founding documents. Uh, to be a safeguard against what we know is true about us. Now, these shortcomings, uh, in some areas, we mitigate them, we tinker, we put in new policies and practices, we try to expand categories of equal protection, uh, which are good things to do. Uh, But when it comes to capital punishment, when it comes to the death penalty, when it comes to the intentional taking of a human life, there can be no tinkering, There can't be a room for 
um, hopeful improvement. Uh, we simply need to say and recognize that we will fall short. And when it comes to questions of life and death, we are not to let ourselves go astray. And my third point is that any human person can and is capable of rehabilitation, redemption, or salvation. I heard it said uh, here, and I've heard it said in actually many venues outside of uh, rooms of testimony, that sometimes people believe that um, there are individuals who are so evil they have gone beyond redemption. They have gone beyond rehabilitation and then must be given a death penalty. Um, I will say, first of all, that that is clearly a religious belief. That is a religious belief that our moral choices can so corrupt us as to be hopeless for salvation, redemption, or rehabilitation. Um, I don't know. I, I cannot say what religion that belief belongs to because I know that it does not belong to the religion of Christianity. Christianity believes that every single person can be brought to redemption, salvation, and rehabilitation through the gift of God. And I bring that up not just to articulate theology or spiritual beliefs or uh, sectarian views of the Bible, but simply to say these are the three things, human equality, the sacredness of human life, and the idea the central Christian belief that all people can be brought to redemption are held by many, many granite staters. They are held in the districts and among the people that you represent. And that is why I'm here for those reasons, the sacredness of human life, human equality as created by God, and the possibility of rehabilitation that I come here to urge you to support Senate Bill 593. Uh, thank you very much. Chairman Welch and members of the committee, for the record, I'm Senator Martha Fuller-Clark. I represent District 21, which is the city of Portsmouth and six surrounding inland seacoast communities that consist of Newfields, Newington, Newmarket, Lee, Madbury, and Durham. And I come before you today as one of the co-sponsors of this important legislation. You have heard and you will hear all the reasons why the intentionality taking of a human life is wrong and why substituting incarceration for life is an appropriate alternative and will ensure that miscarriage of justice in such cases can be rectified if at a later time a defendant is to be found not guilty of a capital crime. And we have seen that occur in a number of other states um, throughout this country. I'm here simply to add my voice that it is time for New Hampshire to join those states in this country and around the world who have already outlawed the death penalty. I want to say that frankly it is past time and that I would hope that this committee would step forward and vote in favor of Senate Bill 593 um, so that all of us can feel that our state is standing up in a humanitarian way for the rights of all individuals by not condemning any one of those individuals through the court system to death. So thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. Oh, then I won't worry about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Stephen Canib. I am from Southampton, and I'm privileged to represent the Roman Catholic Diocese of Manchester today. Uh, I was ordained a deacon last year, and I'm very familiar with this matter. Uh, you've heard fine testimony today, uh, many more to come. I don't want to be disrespectful of people's time. Um, our bishop, Peter Labashi, is not able to be here today. I've brought a letter to the committee from him, as well as a written testimony of myself as an individual, a dad, husband, and a deacon. I um, 
would like to quote, though, uh, a very simple paragraph from Bishop Labashi's letter for you to consider. St. John Paul II challenged followers of Christ to be unconditionally pro-life, reminding us that the dignity of human life must never be taken away, even in the case of someone who has done great evil. This belief is the sanctity of every human person is central to what we believe as Catholics. I appreciate your time today and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Robert Clegg, and I'm from Hudson, and I'm here actually representing myself. I want to first caution you that sometimes people get a little rambunctious and, and talk about actually expanding the death penalty, and I heard that today, and I want to point out that if we actually wanted to do what he said, we would have to take into consideration what just happened in, in New Hampshire based on what mistakes volunteers from CASA had done. We had two children that were used in sex videos. We had a couple that died. Do we really want to expand the death penalty so that people who are trying to do the right thing get killed as well? I, I think that's not the right way. And when we talk, Barbara Keeshan, Barbara Keeshan did a great job telling you that nothing's retrospective in the legislature unless the legislature makes it so. So this shouldn't be about Addison. In fact, it shouldn't be about anybody in the past, because if you want to talk about the past, at the same time we had the Addison case, we had the rich white guy who hired two guys to take a five-pound sledgehammer to a handyman because he thought he stole some Harley parts. That didn't make the papers as much as the other one did. But it's just as much an attack on the social structure as anything else. A $50 Harley part resulted in a 15-minute beating with a five-pound sledgehammer over somebody's head. And yet there was no death penalty there. They have life in prison. And I'm here to say that I think that's an appropriate punishment for anybody who recklessly and wantonly wants to take somebody else's life. Because death penalty doesn't do much more than guarantee that somebody will sit in a cell all by themselves with all the books and all the lawyers and all the comforts that you don't get in general population. Someone who I now call a friend of mine, Randy Steidel, spent 17 years on death row in Illinois. He was accused of murdering two people in their home and then setting the home on fire. It was the most corrupt production I'd ever seen. It included the police department, it included the prosecutor, and, and it included the town drunk and the town um, drug addict to say that they were both in the place and saw them actually commit the murders and start the thing on fire and nothing actually... Um, everybody's statement conflicted. Long story short, it turned out that this gentleman and his friend had turned in the prosecutor for illegal drug work prior to the murders, and they became the subject or, or the, the, the scapegoats. One of the people, Randy Steidel, his brother was actually a state trooper in Illinois, and he said what I used to believe was true. His brother slammed the chair down on the, on the, in, on the floor in front of the jail cell and said to Randy, police don't make mistakes. You're guilty or we wouldn't have arrested you. Seventeen years later, this man finally got his freedom back. The murders were done because of the Gambino family. It was done because of heroin and machine guns. It was done for everything that we as a society think is terrible. When Randy finally got his freedom, the prosecutor who had created the situation to the point it was, received no punishment. The record is sealed. People like me know where to look in the record to reveal some of what happened, but the record is sealed. The state of Illinois decided that since the prosecutor didn't act within the scope of his job, they wouldn't pay the man for the 17 years they'd taken from him. Now, can this happen in New Hampshire? Of course it can. <coughs> Happens all the time. Look at the Knapp murder. 
Look how easy it was to get somebody to say, yeah, I saw him do it. Of course, eyewitness testimony is the worst testimony you ever want to rely on. Circumstantial evidence is much better because you actually have to prove it. But unfortunately, it's always the easy way out. And I'll mention again, why is it that the Brooks murder resulted in a lesser penalty than the Addison murder. Both are heinous. In fact, the Brooks murder was actually, if you read the case, much worse. And if we look at what happened to those kids, we heard about the rope around someone's neck in Claremont. What's worse, a rope around your neck or being used for sexual purposes in a video? I offer that they're both just as horrible and neither one should be acceptable. But I don't think we want to start saying that we're going to start killing everybody over it. I want you to all know that at one time I stood at the well in Reps Hall and I was for the death penalty. And I honestly believed at that time that we don't make mistakes. But after talking to about 56 exonerees, people who have been innocent and who have waited years and spent years on death row, to finally be exonerated, I know we do. There's now 168 exonerees that we know of in the state. We have no idea how many we put away that weren't guilty. We don't know because we don't dig them back up to see. If they've already been killed, they've already been killed. And I'll tell you that a lot of them on their way to the final moments are happy that it's finally over because they've been fighting as innocent people. Randy Steidel gave up his 10-year-old his son, his 14-year-old daughter, and his marriage because he knew that he didn't want them visiting him in prison for the rest of their lives, even though he was innocent. And there are a whole lot of others like that. But that's the innocent, at least as he says. I can be found innocent and get my life back, but the guy we buried never comes back. So when we make that mistake, we make it forever. Now, if you think that life in prison is fun, it's not. Randy Steider will tell you that the one time they decided that he shouldn't be on death row and they put him out in general population, first thing they did was corner him in the yard and slice his throat. Lucky for him, they missed by three centimeters the juggler vein. So it's not fun. You don't get to stay in a cell all by yourself. You never know who your, your cellmate's going to be, and you never know whether he's crazier than you are. So it's not like we're giving somebody something good, but what we're giving people is the opportunity, if they are able to, to redeem themselves. One, as Randy says, the man who sits in jail cell all day long has the opportunity to either find God or find the, the, the road to hell. And those are his words, not mine. I'm not as religious as some people have stood up here before you. I come from a religious family. I can't quote the Bible. I'm not about to. But as a person who has seen innocent people suffer from this law, I'm asking you to do the right thing, which is to change the law in the state of New Hampshire to life in prison. No parole. So the bad guy doesn't get away. He stays. <coughs> but we don't make that mistake like we almost made in the Knapp case. And we don't make the mistake that's happened to the 56 exonerees that I've met who've lost most of their lives but who've spent plenty of time coming here and every other place to tell you just what it's like and that this is not a just punishment. It's anything but. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Gray Fitzgerald. I live here in Concord. I'm a retired United Church of Christ pastor, and I'm currently chair of the Justice and Witness Ministry of the, of the United Church of Christ New Hampshire Conference. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Obviously, those of us in the Christian faith are coming out of the celebration of Easter. 
but we also remember that the events of Easter were preceded by an execution, the execution of Jesus. So our faith is rooted in following a man who was executed. Obviously, from the Christian perspective, that execution was a huge injustice. It's also impossible to imagine this man who was unjustly executed advocating for the execution of others. When we put all that together, for us to support the death penalty would be extremely incongruous. Not only incongruous, but unfaithful. As we remember that Jesus was put to death unjustly, we also are aware, as others have said today, that many in this country have also been executed unjustly. Only after they are put to death is it discovered that they were innocent. In a similar way, many have been on death row for many years that are also innocent. Our system of justice has many strengths but one doesn't have to read many of these stories to be aware that we are very imperfect human beings and that our system of justice is fallible. When our justice system fails, the consequence should not be the death of an innocent person. In the preamble to the United States Constitution, there are the words, in order to form a more perfect union. We all know that we won't ever establish a completely perfect union or a perfect justice system, but we can establish a more perfect justice system. You can do that by abolishing the death penalty in New Hampshire. Please do that. Thank you for your Thank you, Chairman Welch and members of the committee. My name is Grace Mattern. I live in Northwood. You've heard many reasons today um, to support abolishing the death penalty. I won't repeat any of those. I just want to talk about my perspective as someone who has worked in the victim services field for my entire adult life. I spent 30 years as the executive director of the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I'm not here representing them today, I'm representing myself. I also spent many years on national boards of directors of sexual violence and domestic violence organizations and have a lot of experience working with victims of crime. You've already heard from some victims today that they feel as if the death penalty would not have any way helped their family having lost someone to murder. And in general, what I have found in my work with victims is that victims do not seek vengeance or retribution. What victims want is healing and closure. And the way that the death penalty plays out in our current criminal justice system, victims get anything but healing and closure when there's a death penalty case that involves their family. I just wanted to bring that perspective of victims to you and counter any arguments that somehow the death penalty makes things better for victims' families because it simply doesn't. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Paul Lutz. Um, I am a 30-year veteran of law enforcement here in New Hampshire. I retired as a lieutenant. Um, Dr. Goldstein, Chief Goldstein, who um, testified earlier, we have been friends for um, the entire 38 years of his career, and we remain friends. We have uh, slightly different perspectives on this, and I'd like to share mine. Um, we know that, and you know definitely better than I do, that um, we are a state of limited financial resources and we do the best we can with what we have. The enumeration of the amount of money it takes to successfully prosecute a death penalty case has been bantered around somewhere to date between four and five million dollars. The Department of Corrections estimates 
it costs about $35,000 to incarcerate an inmate for a year. At that rate, one, prosecu one prosecution could successfully house an inmate for about 130 years. Now, I would say that that's a pretty absurd extrapolation of what might happen, but what's not absurd is the fact that we're spending money that could be spent in other places. As Dr. Goldstein expl explained earlier, the conclusion of his testimony, and social scientists will tell you that people who commit crimes are not deterred by thinking about the potential ramifications of what they're going to do. And it's not just the fact that they don't think about it because they're overcome with emotion. Think about this. What do people who commit crimes do? They plan. They're too smart to get caught. They don't care if they did know what the penalty was, potentially. They don't care because they're going to thwart the system. They're too smart to get caught. Keeping that in mind, with $5 million, I had a few figures here, and that, for instance, if we were to take that money that we would otherwise spend and grant it proportionately by population to police departments to fight street crime, domestic violence, opioid abuse, any of those things, and we were to distribute that amongst the cities and towns in this state, Manchester, about $405,000. Concord, about $165,000. Communities like Derry, Dover, Salem, Portsmouth, about $125,000. I would uh, probably venture to guess that you would not find one chief of police that would come before you and turn down that money for criminal suppression and investigation. Money well spent. Money executing somebody, money very, very much wasted. We are the only... Oh, this particular penalty is the only thing that remains of an archaic, in-kind system of criminal justice. Indulge me if you will. If we were to extrapolate this downward, and a person was to come before the court for the offense of simple assault, the judge would say, guilty. The bailiff is directed to take the defendant out and punch him in the face. Sounds funny, right? Criminal mischief. Somebody smashes the windshield out of my car. There's a prank in my driveway while I'm asleep. The court directs the defendant to produce his vehicle in a court parking lot, and the bailiff is directed to take a baseball bat and smash his windshield out. How absurd is that? Totally absurd. But I will tell you that if we continue to go up that chain, we will get to systems of criminal justice that exist in this world that still adhere to in-kind punishment up to and including sexual assault. And I'm not going to detail in-kind punishment when it comes to sexual assault because even the prospect is, in, is just sickening. So we have to ask ourselves, is that the type of civilization that we want to be? Is that the type of civilization and criminal justice that system that we want to adhere to? I don't think any of us do. I'm going to leave you with this one thought, and it's one that I was uh, availed of recently. 19, excuse me, 2014. Charles Kondek, a patrolman in Toppin Springs, Florida, received a call for loud music coming from a car. He approached the car, ostensibly to tell the person to turn the music down, nothing more. Unbeknownst to him, 
the person in the car was first of all engaged in a large-scale drug operation and secondly armed with a stolen gun. He shot Charles Conduct in the face and killed him immediately. The defendant was tried and sentenced to death in the state of Florida. He remains on death row to this day. Charles Conduct's father, a retired New York City police officer, I listened to an interview where Charles Conduct's father said, why couldn't they just throw him in jail? Why do they have to do this to me over and over and over again? If you talk to anyone who's involved in psychological counseling, grief, care, if you were to graph the progression of recovery from grief, it peaks at about six months. And recovery doesn't begin until after that period. Six months from the time of the death. Condex's father said, I can't move on. I can't move on. I can't begin to construct a memorial, a fond memorial of my son. Here's a man that put over 30 years of his life out in the street, in the NYPD. I can't begin to do that. I can't put this away. Every time I think it's going to happen, it's like picking the scab. I have to go before the court and reliving it over and over again. So much for closure. So much for doing something for the victims. It doesn't work. I have one son. I have one child. One child, my son, is a police officer, a full-time police officer in the state of New Hampshire. We discuss this issue occasionally. He knows how I feel. Interestingly enough, he feels the same way. And I will tell you, my closing thoughts are that if the unthinkable, God forbid, ever happened and my son was in conduct, conduct's situation, his son's situation, I would tell you that I would sit here before you no happier, that's for sure. But I would sit before you, and my position would be unchanged. Thank you very much. I have prepared some statistical information as handouts for members of the committee, if you choose to peruse them. Representative O'Leary. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for hearing from me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm so. First witness of the afternoon. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Icopino. It's spelled I A C O P I N O. Uh, I am here today uh, on behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and we urge you to pass this bill. Um, the New Hampshire Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers represents about 300 lawyers who uh, have, as a significant part of their practice, they do criminal defense work. I myself have been a criminal defense lawyer for 34 years. Um, I was privileged in 2010 to serve on the death penalty commission um, that studied uh, the death penalty here in New Hampshire. That commission split pretty much down the middle as to whether the death penalty should be abolished. Uh, they did issue a report. I would commend that report to you, especially the minority report, which I authored a substantial part of. Um, and I think that uh, it will inform you. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I learned on the Death Penalty Commission. Two major things that I learned is, number one, there is absolutely zero evidence that the death penalty acts as a deterrent. You heard some anecdotes this morning from some other uh, witnesses. Uh, the folks who actually study these things, the social scientists and the economists that study these things, will tell you that the evidence and we learned this on the Death Penalty Commission as well, that there is no evidence that the death penalty acts as a deterrent to murder or any kind of substantial crime. Um, and you, we also learned that in terms of what you get for, de for in the absence of deterrence, I should say, the cost is astronomical. 
You're not getting the public policy that you want. You're not getting people deterred from committing murders. About a year after we, we finished the death penalty study, um, there was another study from National, National Research Council which confirmed exactly what the minority report found, which was that there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that you're going to have a deterrent effect from the death penalty. So why do we have it? If there's one reason to have the death penalty, it's because it's supposed to deter people from committing murders. And it's been demonstrated through both social science and economic studies that it does not. And our cost is, is astounding. I know that you have a fiscal note on the bill before you that says that the defense cost to the public defender program of a recent uh, capital case, in the Addison case, was approximately $2.8 million, and the prosecution costs were approximately $2.5 million, and I assume that both of those are continuing to accrue since Mr. Addison's federal appeals have not even gotten started yet. Um, that's an astronomical cost. You also have before you in the fiscal note a uh, estimate of what the average case that goes to trial is on a first-degree murder charge, which I believe, for the prosecution standpoint, was four to five hundred thousand um, dollars. So it's at least ten times, uh, and it's probably more than that because, quite frankly, the numbers that are in your fiscal note were the same numbers that we heard at the time of the death penalty commission study in 2010. So I don't know how how much they've been updated since then. Twenty-five years ago this year, Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld started the Innocence Project at Cardozo Law School in New York City. Um, they're going to have a big gala this, this summer, I believe, celebrating 2050 year. You've heard already about exonerations. We've had some very lucky people who have had the opportunity to actually interview some exonerees. If you go to their website today, they will tell you that there have been 354 DNA exonerations. That's people who were convicted of crimes and then years later, DNA proved that they weren't the people who committed the crime. That's error in our criminal justice system, and it doesn't just happen in other places, it happens here. In the 34 years that I've been a criminal defense lawyer, I have learned that all of these things happen here. The Innocence Project will tell you that erroneous eyewitness testimony, incentivized informants, bad forensic science, <coughs> governmental misconduct, those are the major causes of wrongful convictions. Those are things that don't just happen in other places, they happen here. And I would add to them politics and race as well. Right here in New Hampshire, you've already heard, and I won't belabor the point, about the erroneous eyewitness identification in the Knapp case. You've already heard about that. That happened right here in New Hampshire. We didn't have to hear about that from some other state. Misapplication or fraudulent forensic science. Well, just south of our border, we've had two, not one, but two uh, lab analysts who were dry labbing, um, dry, dry testing. In other words, just printing reports, not doing the testing. Um, and, and caused significant, actually somebody said 4,000 convictions before. My understanding is 18,000 convictions uh, that are affected by that uh, in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, we've had those issues here in New Hampshire. Several years ago, we had a state lab analyst who was taking samples home with her um, thereby causing, well, thereby putting in jeopardy, cross-contamination uh, cross and things like that. Um, and that was in our own state lab that we all admire and hold up with their as-clad um, as uh, criteria and everything. Um, but we had a, a state lab analyst who was taking them home. That's not good science. It happened right here in New Hampshire. We've had testimony of senior analysts from the state lab who didn't do the actual testing. They've come to court, they've used their seniority to bolster their opinions, but as it turned out, with further discovery, it was some lab tech or an intern who actually did the actual testing. That's right here in New Hampshire. We've had, some of you are probably well aware of the medical examiner uh, scandal that we had a few years ago, where drugs were being uh, taken by the uh, responding assistant medical examiners. Uh, from, from places where somebody was deceased, where there'd been an untimely death. That's evidence that's disappearing for that medical examiner's own purposes, whatever they were, whether to sell or to use or to somehow make a case. We've had a, a, a pediatric doctor in New Hampshire who in a very serious sexual assault case 
of a child, redacted reports and didn't tell the court or the prosecutors or the defense lawyer uh, until they were in the middle of trial. These things happen right here in New Hampshire. We've had misconduct in New Hampshire by judges, by prosecutors, by defense lawyers. We've had defense lawyers who haven't done their jobs, cases that have had to be overturned because of ineffective assistance of counsel. All of those things have happened right here in New Hampshire. We've had politics injected into the entire capital, uh, capital murder debate. Um, we had a prior attorney general who ran for senator. She ran two commercials based upon her prosecution in a capital case. There was uh, an email that was released prior to her, uh, that was, email was from just prior to her running for, uh, for Senate, indicating that, hey, I've, I'm prosecuting these uh, capital murder cases. Maybe I should run for senator. And whether you believe that that person was a good senator or not, it's an improper consideration, I, re I respectfully suggest to you. And finally, and I, I know this will, this will make some people angry, um, but I've been doing this long enough now and I've appeared before here to know that most of you who know me know that I really believe this, is we also have racial discrimination in our capital, uh, capital murder system here in New Hampshire. We're not above that either. And there is no, no better example than what happened a few years ago. Uh, Ms., uh, former Senator Clegg alluded to it. The rich white guy with a very heinous, convicted of a very heinous murder, did not get the death penalty. The poor black young man, and I don't mean, I mean poor economically, I don't mean to suggest that he's somehow sympathetic, uh, but he got the death penalty. Even though in that case, if you look at the verdict form, the jury found that he did not plan or premeditate that murder. And you can, you can look at that right on the uh, Superior Court's website. So, for those reasons, I respectfully suggest to you that when you consider this, I ask that you not, con not engage in the considerations that we've heard in the past, that somehow this can't happen here in New Hampshire. Our New Hampshire advantage, or, this, or the fact that we're special, somehow protects us. If you, want the New Hampshire, if you want a New Hampshire advantage in the criminal justice system, you'll vote to repeal the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Daryl Perry, CEO of Liberty Lobby, LLC. I've uh, passed out some written testimony. Uh, I'm very pleased that the former speaker did mention the Innocence Project. I will very happily be representing them in the New York City Marathon this fall. And they just celebrated their 200th exoneration since they were founded 25 years ago. One organization has been directly involved in helping 200 people get exonerated for crimes they did not commit. I, I would ask all of you to take just half an hour and listen to one episode of the podcast, Wrongfully Convicted, where one of the original uh, members of the Innocence Project host a podcast every week where he interviews people who spent 10, 15, 20, 30, 38 years or more in jail for crimes they did not commit. I listened to an episode on the way up here this morning of a man who spent 38 years in prison for a rape that he did not commit. And one of the reasons he spent so long is a lot of the evidence had been destroyed. And they admitted that they destroyed most of the evidence, but it was 12 years after he first contacted the Innocence Project that someone with the prosecutor's office said, oh, wait a second, we happen to have a couple of hairs that we did not destroy. And it was because of those hairs he was able to ultimately be exonerated for a crime he did not commit. And if just one innocent person winds up being prosecuted or murdered, for a crime they did not commit, I consider that to be fundamentally immoral and to force anyone here who opposes killing people to pay to murder someone, I consider that to be the ultimate immoral act. So 
Thank you for listening to me. Please read the handouts that I gave, read my written testimony, and pass SB 593. Good afternoon. Um, I have some handouts, so what I'd like to do, Ray, thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is the test one. I think that's one. This is two. Thank you. It is. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, great. And, uh, is, uh, did I hear someone say the microphone wasn't working? So this is my outdoor voice. That's what I used to tell my kids. So we'll, we'll use my outdoor voice. Okay, um, I'm, uh, my name's Carol Stamaticus. Um I live in Lempster, New Hampshire, um, which for those of you who may not know is in Sullivan County. Um, I've lived there for 33 years, um, and I'm speaking today as a private citizen and as a daughter of a murder victim. Um, my father was murdered in 1997 in Ohio. Um, he was shot and bludgeoned at his place of work um, which was a furniture store that he had owned and operated for over 30 years. Um, he was a very hardworking Greek immigrant, um, a beloved member of the community who didn't have any known enemies. Um, he was killed in an apparent robbery at around noon on a spectacularly beautiful day in late May, um, the Thursday before the Memorial Day weekend. Um, there were never any arrests in my father's case, and the case is still, um, still unsolved. Um, the events following my father's death were not what I would have expected. Um, I immediately flew along with my family to be with my mother, as did my sister and her family and um, various other um, friends and relatives to be supportive. And um, I certainly would have expected a lot of police activity, et cetera, um, but it was a, initially a very quiet um, Memorial Day weekend, really no, no, you know, no contact, nothing. And I thought, well, maybe this was because it was the weekend and that things would, you know, th that things would happen after the weekend. And so um, what ended up happening um, is that in, in his case, the days turned to weeks, the weeks turned to months, and really nothing happened. Um, there was very little, um, very little activity. Um, in, in my father's situation, we learned that there was very little gathering of physical evidence. Um, certainly initially, um, you know, my mother was interviewed, um, there was some communication. Um, but for the most part, after that, the communication that happened was when she or a member of the family <laughs> called the police to inquire, you know, as, as to what might be going on. Um, it was very clear from the beginning that the investigation pretty much consisted of the police hoping that um, someone they picked up on another crime would know something and be willing to provide information. And I'm sure they interviewed you know, the usual ne'er-do-wells in the neighborhood to see if they knew anything. Um, but very little or no gathering of physical evidence or, or anything like that. Um, I, I remember very clearly um, something that happened that really, um, I think, caused members of our family to really start to lose hope. And I don't remember exactly when it happened, but my mother, um, was involved in cleaning, um, organizing things at my father's workplace and happened to find his eyeglasses um, in a location of the building very far from where his body was found. So she thought this look was something that was probably significant, that if somebody did come forward and have a story, certainly, you know, being able to tie it into that spot might be important. Um, so she immediately called the police, spoke with um, 
you know, either the investigator or someone in their office. And she said she felt that, you know, they thanked her, but it was her impression they didn't even write down that piece of information. Um, so she was completely devastated at that point um, because it showed us kind of what, what we were dealing with. Um, so as time went on, you know, I certainly became more ambivalent about the police making an arrest and was concerned that given the nature of the investigation, I really wondered how they could get a conviction or maintain it through appeals um, and wondered how we could even feel confident that they had the right person. Um, at some point, my father's case became a cold case, and I think um, it's important to understand that nobody announces that. No one calls the family or gives us anything or tells us anything saying, you know, it's um, now in that status. Um, so we, that's really something that, that we don't know. And that's really an administrative decision. Um, that means that no more time or resources can be spent on a particular case um, due to the passage of time. And so what I found based on my research is that that really varies depending on the community and the resources. So in some low-income urban areas, cases become cold much, much, much faster than they would in a community with a different composition or different resources. Um, so I, um, as I said, initially things played out in a way I really didn't expect at all. You know, I knew uh, my father's relationships in the community. I knew his relationships with the police. It didn't make sense. It, you know, what I was seeing didn't add up. And so I started to do some research on my own and learned a lot that I think people really don't know and still don't know. Um, when my father was killed, I think there may have been a TV show or something that sort of popularized the idea of cold cases, and I think that probably happened after he died. So at the time he died, that, you know, the idea of a cold case wasn't even in most people's vocabulary. And I had done, I'm a lawyer by profession, I used to prosecute child abuse cases, I worked with the police, it wasn't even really in my vocabulary. I vaguely knew it meant a case that, you know, hadn't been solved and through passage of time wasn't really being investigated, but it, you know, it was not um, something that was a part of my day-to-day -day life for most people. But what I've learned through my research is that the number of unsolved homicides is absolutely staggering, both in our region and nationwide. Um, according to FBI statistics for 2016, which is the last year I could um, find statistics online, 40.6% of homicides or are unsolved or what they call uncleared. And I've handed out materials explaining what the concept of clearance means. And clearance does not mean that there's a prosecution or conviction. It basically just means that they know who the person, you know, was, or, or the police believe they know who, who, who did it. Um, it's sort of tied in with arrest, but there's some cases considered cleared where there's even no arrest made. So that 40.6%, it does not mean, or, or the conversely, the 59.4 that's cleared, does not mean there's a conviction and does not mean that there's peace and closure for the family. That number is actually much, would be much, much smaller, and I, I don't have that figure. Um, so when I first learned this, I was totally shocked and horrified um, that the number could be so high. And what you'll see from my handouts is that the percentage of uncleared homicides has surprisingly risen steadily for decades. So if you go back to 1965, you'll see that number at 91%, and it's been a steady decline downward um, since then to where we are now. Um, in some cities, the rate of uncleared homicides is uh, well above 50%. Um, some, uh, you know, close to like 85, I've even seen. Um, of, of uncleared cases. So um, again, I, I've attached that documentation to just help really educate you about this because I feel it's something really a critically important um, part of the big picture. And any murder victim family member is much, 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 much more likely to be one of those uncleared case numbers than they are to be a family involved in a death penalty case. 
you know, those cases are a tiny, tiny minority of, you know, of, of cases. And the, the number of, un, of, of uncleared cases is, you know, you, I don't even know what. It, so I think um, there's a lot of reasons for that, and it's something I've spent a lot of personal time researching just to really understand, to understand why, you know, something like this could have happened to my father and my family. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons. There's changes in how prosecutors function. Um, now they want cases to be much more airtight, so even when there is a clear suspect, they very often won't prosecute. Um, very often you see plea bargains that appear bizarre, where somebody commits an exceptionally violent, horrible crime, and you see a light sentence. And that has to do with the system driving cases in the direction of plea bargains, even in cases where they appear to be unjust. I mean, so th those are just a few things, but the changing nature of homicides. But in every case, whenever a cold case is talked about, what always comes up is how it's a reflection of how our criminal justice dollars are being spent. And lack of adequate resources is always cited as the reason for the uh, primary reason driving the large number of uncleared or cold cases. Um, in New Hampshire, I uh, don't know if anyone's shared this statistic yet, but the last, uh, the, the website, which I think is not up to date, identifies 126 um, unsolved cases. And my father appears on a similar list in Ohio, um, also close to his name, um, I think maybe right after his, because they're by date, um, was a, a longtime friend of his, a man who was um, in his 90s and who was murdered in the same neighborhood. He was also a shopkeeper um, within, I want to say, weeks of my father's death um, on that list. Um, very often, um, we should have a death penalty. And I can't speak for everyone, um, but certainly for people in my family's situation, I can share with you what would make a difference. Um, for, for a family member. Uh, and I would say first and foremost would be knowing um, what happened to our loved ones, um, to the extent to which that information can be ascertained. Even if there's not a prosecution, the gaps. We had a situation where we learned from a newspaper report that my father's murder was more violent than what we had initially been led to believe. Um, we knew he was shot. We later learned he was bludgeoned as well. And that was in a, a graphic sort of sensationalistic newspaper article. That's how we learned. Um, so um, uh, some of the other factors, I guess, that I would, I would cite to would be providing support for families. <coughs> Um, programs that su support, provide support to victims and help them understand and cope with the criminal justice system, um, I think are extremely important. And again, resources. I mean, making sure that local police have the resources. And I guess, you know, what kills me, you know, is I, I've heard different numbers thrown around, um, and I mentioned in, I think, my written testimony, the last number I heard was <coughs> five million something for prosecution and defense costs in this one case. And I think, you know, couldn't they, they could, just thinking about what could be done with that amount of money, you know, in terms of just letting police investigate more cases and not even just homicides, for heaven's sakes. You know, I know people whose lives are destroyed by vandalism, robbery. In these cases have much, much low um, clearance rates than, than homicides. So just thinking about how, how other ways we could use the money. Um, and then just a word about deterrence. When we know that such a hum huge number of cases are uncleared, the notion that uh, the occasional death penalty case could be a deterrent, it's absurd. It's completely absurd. There's no deterrence. It's not possible. It just, uh, it's not there. Um, so I guess, um, you know, and, and, you know, another, while they don't know, you know, what happened in my father's case, they know the neighborhood was deteriorating. He was one of those pig-headed people that wouldn't retire, despite the fact that, you know, the neighborhood was becoming more crime-ridden. Um, so, and, and there was substance abuse going on and drug dealers, et cetera. So certainly having some more resources, you know, going into those social problems would have, you know, might have made a difference. 
Um, but as I said, you know, I, I became ambivalent when I kind of learned what, you know, what, what the investigation consisted of. And I guess just a, a final thought is that when you do that based on the world as it really is and not on some idea of cops and robbers, and I get so frustrated when we hear about the death penalty in the media that very often I think where police have resources, where they do thorough, proper investigations, where they get the right guy, where, you know, where everything happens like a storybook. It just, that's, that's not reality. And, um, you know, I think that that's not, certainly not the experience of those of us living with cold cases and not the experience of um, death, ra death row inmates or families where there have been genuine um, questions of innocence. Um, so I think it's important that we all be brave enough to look at the world with all of its imperfections um, and as our understanding of effective criminal justice evolves, that we be willing to revisit our past assumptions, um, focus on what really works, what really will help keep us safer, um, and look at our human limitations. You know, and I just find as I get older and older, it's just more of a challenge to figure out how do I relate to people understanding human limitations, you know, and that people um, are challenged to do the best they can despite those limitations. Um, so I, I feel that because of those limitations and our collective human frailties um, and the inevitability of error that um, the death penalty can never be justified. And I just, I wanted to just add a personal note. Um, as I was driving here, I was reflecting on um, how this is not the first time I've given this testimony. Um, I first uh, did when I, I had been in the legislature a long, long time ago, uh, late 80s and early 90s, and um, knew him then. And so since that time, I've testified a couple of times, uh, or a few times for this, as well as um, for support for cold cases. I've testified on that as well. And so driving here, you know, I, it's been, was four years since, um, but it's also bittersweet and it always makes me think about my father. And so I guess what I'd ask you to do are a couple of things. One, pass this bill. Um, two, pass it by a humongous margin and try to get your other colleagues to, to support that so that it passes by a big, huge margin. Um, if you have a relationship with the governor, talk to him about it to try to get him to support it and make it so that this is the last time. Um, that I'm here in. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Timothy King. I am a uh, sergeant with the uh, Concord Police Department, and I'm here today representing the uh, New Hampshire Police Association. Um, I will be very brief because much of my testimony would be uh, would be redundant. Uh, I want to thank you all for your patience and uh, uh, taking on this uh, worthy cause. Um, we are opposed to this bill. Um, we believe that the uh, death penalty has a place in the uh, New Hampshire criminal justice system. Um, we would uh, like you to stay focused on the New Hampshire history of the death penalty and uh, many of the words and presentation that uh, Attorney Chuck Douglas uh, made here today. Um, we are very concerned with the uh, sentence reduction of uh, Michael Addison and uh, uh, as it was presented earlier, Mr. Addison is not an innocent man, okay, uh, even his attorneys uh, concede that point. Um, and uh, we don't want to make this, uh, we don't want to focus uh, on a, uh, a dollar issue with the death penalty. Uh, the dollars associated to the death penalty uh, are part of the system of the death penalty to make sure that uh, these cases are vetted out uh, after the uh, initial verdict is uh, is given. And uh, that's all I want to present to you. I want to thank you. And uh, we did make an electronic uh, submission to the uh, panel uh, individually. Thank you very much. Thank you. It could be less. 
so uh, my name is Leonard Korn. I'm a psychiatrist. I have been practicing in New Hampshire since 1974. I practice in Portsmouth and I live in Newcastle. I am the president of the New Hampshire Medical Society and I come to you today to talk about uh, this bill and to encourage you to vote in support of it, i.e. to uh, uh, eliminate the death penalty in New Hampshire. There are many arguments and most of them have been made relative to repeal of the death penalty. They come from many different perspectives, religious, moral, pragmatic, legal, financial, medical, and psychiatric and psychological. I'm going to focus on medical and psychological and psychiatric issues. Organized medicine, and I'm referring in particular to the American Medical Association, has opposed physicians participating in the process of the death penalty since 1980. The reason for this prohibition is that killing a prisoner is a violation of section one of the AMA principles of medical ethics, which states that a physician should be dedicated to providing competent medical care with compassion and respect for human rights. It's unfortunate that other less qualified medical personnel have been employed in the procedures of administering lethal injections and the death penalty, often inadequately and always inhumanely, in violation of these important ethical principles. Governor Sununu has offered two reasons for his opposition to repeal of the death penalty. We certainly hope he will reconsider. He expressed interest in supporting crime victims and supporting the death penalty for the most heinous crimes. I think we can all agree that there's no more heinous crime than murder. I think we had about 15,000 homicides last year. Would we as a society murder all these people if we could? What about mistakes? There's well over 150 exonerations already. Are some murders really more heinous than others? With all due respect, and I mean this sincerely, is a school teacher's death by murder, or a child's or adolescent's death by murder, or a brother or sister's? death by murder? More heinous than a policeman's death by murder? I don't think so. As a psychiatrist, I've always, I, I've been involved and concerned about violence throughout my career. As a society, we try to focus on violence reducing it, not condoning it. Violence, of course, comes in many forms, from bullying in our schools to sexual, physical, and emotional abuse in our homes and workplaces, and, of course, more murder in our homes and our streets. We certainly don't punish bullies by bullying them, nor should we punish abusers by abusing them. So why do we punish murderers by murdering them? Elective murder by the state is not the best thing we can do in a civilized society. Indeed, it's a form of violence. It's a state-supported violence. We can do better and we should. It is not a good example to murder, to show that murder is wrong. Now I want to also discuss healing. 
as healing from wounds is what we as physicians try to do in our practice of medicine. And psychiatrists, of course, focus on emotional wounds, which we know can be just as traumatic, if not really actually more traumatic and more long-lasting than physical wounds. Emotional wounds can actually last a lifetime, if not even longer. As I've heard testimony and uh, discussions from children of Holocaust victims, where the uh, emotional wounds get passed down from generation to generation. Murder of a loved one is such a trauma, such a deep emotional wound, that healing at best is a long and torturous road, requiring much support and love that a family and a community can give. Do we honestly think that putting a convicted murder to death by taking 10 or 20 years of trials and appeals helps the victims of murder in their healing? That's absolutely absurd. Many years of publicity and personal appearances by families and others just perpetuates the pain, reopens the wounds that's of such a violent death. Administering the death penalty thus interferes with healing with the emotional attempts at closure for the victims of murder. Rather than, as uh, the governor said, strengthening the laws for crime victims. Many fam family members of, vic of, of victims of murder oppose the death penalty. We've heard of some from some today. But those that do not, unfortunately, and I mean this sincerely for them, they, their wounds, their healing is prolonged. It interferes with the uh, wounds healing. And thinking about wounds related to the death penalty, there's another important factor to consider, and people have talked about that already, and I'll just say it briefly. The emotional wounds inflicted on individuals who were involved in the procedures and administration of the death penalty. As a member of the New Hampshire Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, we've heard and read about the effects on those individuals who participate in the process of administering the death penalty, the actual killing of those on death rows wardens, prison workers, <coughs> prosecutors, defense attorneys have experienced depression, anxiety, PTSD as a result of participating in the process of the death penalty. And those wounds don't often heal. Since we all know that killing is really only reasonable if we have no other choice other than to defend ourselves or others, do we want to continue to subject so many individuals and state workers in our state to this, I'll call it a heinous process of killing when life without parole is available as an alternative? So I've discussed some of the reasons for uh, supporting this bill and abolishing the death penalty. I want to just read the final lines of John Donne's 17th century poem, No Man is an Island. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls it tolls for thee. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Arnie Alpert. I'm the New Hampshire co-director for the American Friends Service Committee. I'm also the grandson of Charlie Alpert, who owned a hardware store in Springfield, Massachusetts uh, in early 1967 when I was 11 years old. My grandfather surprised a burglar in his store late at night. The burglar grabbed a claw hammer and beat him over the head and killed him. Um, I would love to tell you at another time about my grandfather and about our family's reaction to that, uh, but I want to save time for some other things today. I want to thank you for your attention and your patience today as we deal with a very difficult question, and that is what do we do as a society about murder? How do we prevent it? How do we respond to it when it happens? And as the people who have to make public policy in this regard, that's what you've been hearing a lot about today. The death penalty as we know it right now in New Hampshire aims to distinguish between different types of murders, to try to decide which murders are so bad that the person who did it deserves what we call the ultimate penalty and that's to be put to death themselves at the hands of and on behalf of us, the citizens. Uh, I would suggest that this is an extremely difficult task to try to make that distinction, to try to decide who are the worst of the worst, or try to decide which of these categories of murder represent the biggest or more serious assaults on our society. That's what we've heard uh, from others that the death penalty tries to do. I want to bring up one case that happened 50 years ago today in Memphis, Tennessee, and that was the murder of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It's hard to imagine when we think about what Dr. King stood for, when he's the person who as much as anyone, certainly in the 20th century, embodied our dreams for the fulfillment of democracy in this country. A person who consistently preached, taught, and practiced nonviolence despite the fact that he had been living under death threats from the time his house was bombed during the Montgomery bus boycott at the beginning of his public career and who lived with death threats throughout his entire life. In fact, one of my AFSC colleagues was with him in Memphis on the morning that Dr. King was killed and one of the staff people said, Dr. King, don't you think that we ought to uh, arm ourselves and be ready for things? And Dr. King said on his last morning, I believe in nonviolence and that's the way it's going to be. The death of Dr. Martin Luther King was a serious blow against the dream of democracy. It was a serious blow against the possibility of bringing about change through nonviolence. And yet his family has been very clear in their support for abolition of the death penalty. In an editorial and op-ed column published in the New Hampshire Union Leader on January 16, 2014, Dr. King's daughter, Bernice, uh, and I'll, I brought copies of this for everybody, so you don't need to take notes here. But she wrote, having lost my father and my grandfather to homicide, I can well understand the hurt, anger, and frustration that leads some people to support the death penalty. Yet I can't accept the judgment that killers need to be killed, a practice that merely perpetuates the cycle of violence. Yes, we want to see truth and justice prevail, but retribution cannot light the way to the genuine healing that we need in the wake of heinous acts of violence. Instead, state-sponsored killing sets a dehumanizing example of brutality that encourages more violence. Bernice King goes on to say that allowing the state to kill its citizens for any reason diminishes our humanity and sets a sadistic and dangerous precedent that is unworthy of a civilized society. Every execution makes our community a little less humane and carries us further from achieving a peaceful society in which we can all take pride. Dr. King himself famously said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only love can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Excuse me, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And he said in his Nobel Peace Prize speech, he said, man must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. Mr. Chairman, I suggest to you that that should still be our aspiration that passage of this bill does not achieve that 
principle that Dr. King lived and died for, but it takes us a step in that direction, and I encourage you to strongly vote in support of this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and my colleagues here. Randy Cushing, I'm not going to take up much time. I think everything that's important to be said has already been said. I'm struck particularly by the testimony of Carol Stamaticus and Ann Lysak and Arnie Alpert have been in this cauldron that people find themselves in when the worst thing happens to you and somebody gets murdered. Um, this is being a legislature and legislative hearings aren't safe places to talk really about what the impact is of homicide upon survivors. I'll just simply say that I'll save the, some of my experiences and the reason I oppose the death penalty for our discussions in executive session. Um, but I urge you to support Senate Bill 593 because New Hampshire can live with it. Which is, I'm sorry? Did you make out a thing like No, I did not, because I was. This is new for me, so I. So I apologize. This is new to me. Uh, we are the Lutherans in this part of the country. Thank you. I will do that. So, brief remarks. As a pastor for 30 years, I totally understand, and I read congregations, especially when it's around lunchtime. So, I got it. So here's the objections that the Lutherans have to the death penalty. Executions represent an unacceptable, non-restorative approach to violent crime. Capital punishment focuses on retribution, sometimes reflecting a spirit of vengeance. Executions do not restore broken society and can actually work counter to restoration. Two, executions mirror and reinforce social injustice by focusing attention on the criminal's individual's failure and distract from us our work toward a just society. And three, the death penalty cannot be administered justly. We thank you for uh, hearing our uh, issues from the Lutheran Church. And, uh, Dave, did you get my blurb? Thank you. Uh, cool.